Hey everyone and welcome to Learning with Bell Vista Studios. Learning with Bell Vista Studios is an opportunity for us to learn from amazing people in the industry, people who inspire us, who we're curious about and help us do things better. So today I have Eleni here and I am so grateful to have you on the show. Uh, we met a few years ago in a government um, and I just love your Instagram or your LinkedIn posts, sorry, are so cool. They, so, they stand out to me. Um, and just the way you do them, I always see you on LinkedIn and that's sort of how I've kept in contact with you. So it's amazing what you're doing for the LinkedIn community. You're a business psychologist, which I think is absolutely amazing. I love psychology. So I'm so excited to learn from you around that. Um, mm -hmm. and I also noticed on your website that you make people a boss at what they do. And I just love that. <laughs> I think that's oh, so cool. Um, and yeah, at Belvista Studios, we are all about making, helping people be the best versions of themselves. So I think that really awesome. aligns with us. So thank you so much for being on the show. Um, and yeah, My it's absolute. awesome to have you here. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's um, been really nice to get the opportunity to reconnect and I'm really excited about our chat today. <laughs> so, <laughs> The first question is, um, looking at what you do, a lot of it seems to be around mindset. So helping people yep. improve their mindset um, and have the best possible mindset that they can have to do their job really well, to run a team really well. So my first question was, how do you think our mindset can hold us back as individuals? I think our mindset is really everything. So the lens in which we kind of through the um, see the world through, it really kind of dictates all of our feelings, our behaviours, our actions. Um, so that's why I think it is really, really critical to begin with the mindset in mind. Uh, and, you know, particularly now we're in a COVID-19 transitional time and just, yeah, you know, the importance of that positivity and, you know, how important that is when we're trying to innovate and drive change in a really unprecedented kind of environment where there's no rule book or handbook for, you know, how to get from A to B. Um, I think it's just such a big challenge every day and a focus for people to just get up and try to be positive and stay in that right, right mindset. So, um, yeah, I think that positive mindset is really critical, um, as is a really good growth mindset, so abundance mindset. Um, being open to the possibility that, you know, anything is possible. So Carol Dweck, um, she's the author of That Growth Mindset and I really recommend it as a great book for anyone that wants to kind of look into mindset a little bit more. So, yeah, I think mindset's everything. Nice. I love that, the growth and fixed mindset. I agree. It's so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the – so are there, like, unconscious things that can happen in our minds that can hold us back? from being the best that we can, what are some of those things and how would we identify them? I think fear and kind of the fear of failure is a really, really big one that um, holds people back a lot from a mindset perspective. So, um, you know, I think it's really important for leaders and businesses to really uh, make sure that they create a really nice psychologically safe environment for their people. Uh, and again, in a COVID time, you know, that's become um, really, really um, being brought to the fore now about how important and critical that is. Uh, because kind of if people don't feel safe and they don't have kind of all the, their basic needs and they don't feel like they have that good relationship with their manager where there's really good mm. trust and respect or they don't feel comfortable with their team and their colleagues, it's actually going to be really hard for people to speak up and try something new or you know, just stay in that positive mindset. If you've got some of those frustrators or you get up in the morning, you try to be positive, you go through all your exercise, whatever else you kind of your daily habits are, and then you get to work or you open up Zoom and then you kind of feel like you're helpless and you're just faced with this same situation that's just unsurmountable. So I really think that fit between kind of person and environment is really critical. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have to have a healthy mindset, but we've also got to understand ourselves in terms of our inside, what drives us, what's our personality and our work style, and where are we going to be kind of 
best to position ourselves in terms of what kind of boss do we like to work with and what kind of team do we thrive in so that we can really make the best of that kind of mindset um, so that external factors don't hold us back, right? Because even with the best of intentions, we've still got to be able to put ourselves in the, in the right place so we can thrive and have that opportunity to succeed. Yeah, I love that. So what sort of things do you see in teams? Because like you were saying with leaders, if they're not creating an environment of trust or they're not creating a space where people can feel comfortable, what sort of things happens in teams? Like what's the impact of that? Yeah, I think um, first and foremost, people feel really scared to speak up. So what um, can result from that is a lack of innovation in the team and just, um, you know, really fixed thinking and group thinking. So when we are trying to think outside of the box and come up with new ideas, um, that lack of trust can be a big factor that holds teams and individuals back. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, that's a really big one. And then I think it's really important for the manager to just really be mindful of not coming across as intimidating or less approachable because mm. Thing. People just are going to be hesitant to give you feedback about um, what might not be going right um, mm. in the team, in the direction. And then as a leader, you don't want to be in that position because from your perspective, things might be going all good, but actually they're not. And you've just created a culture of fear or hesitancy where people are just not quite sure. They don't feel safe to kind of speak up. Yes. So it has a lot of kind of far reaching consequences. So that's why I just think relationships, teaming relationships are just so, so important. And whenever you're kind of getting into a new team or you've got to really tackle a, a critical project, I think it's really important as part of that kind of teaming process to pay attention to the relationships and um, what role each of us can individually bring to the table to add our own kind of unique flair and our strengths so that the sum of the parts is you know the whole is greater than the sum of the parts type thing mm, I love that so talking about about all that I love how you can sort of pick up when those things are happening within teams what I would love to understand is when so you would have teams coming to you or leaders coming to you for support Yes. How do you how do you understand what their current state is? So how do you know that there's a lack of trust and how do you know what's actually playing out and get that understanding? Yeah. yeah, look, the best thing I think to do is actually be able to kind of go through that understanding process with that individual, so with that leader that comes to me and, and whatever the problem is that they're experiencing, I think a good place to start is always with ourselves. So mm -hmm. I really love deploying kind of leadership assessments that really look at someone's uh, bright side. So uh, how do we see a particular leader operating? What are their strengths um, that they use day to day to kind of get the team on board? Yeah. Uh, what's their inside look like in terms of their values? So um, are they really affiliative or is having impact and power really critical to them? Yeah. Um, what are their drivers, right? So understanding what drives their behaviour and then also having a really good deep dive into dark side because that's the thing that can often trip up leaders under pressure and have mm -hmm. that really big sometimes negative impact on their team. So I think it's really important to go through the process first of raising awareness for leaders about all their great personal strengths that can be uh, really useful when things are going well. If you kind of overuse that and it falls and becomes a derailer, um, having that kind of information about yourself and being able to kind of pull yourself back and having strategies so you don't go into that place, that can be really powerful in terms of kind of uh, having a more positive impact on your team and overcoming some of these problems. So, you know, sometimes starting with the leader is a great place to start or kind of having that kind of conversation just in a team environment where we're not pointing the finger at anyone. It's just a great opportunity for people, each member of the team to understand where are their strengths, how do they like to work and actually be able to have a shared conversation around that. So people just understand where each other are coming from because yeah. we are built so differently and we have mm. different insights. You know, if you're opposite to someone, it can be really hard to kind of understand where they're coming from, especially when you're trying to drive towards an outcome and there's a lot of pressure. 
So that's why it can be really good to have these kind of team development um, understanding sessions offline so that when you do get into these kind of work periods where there's a lot of pressure, people just have that really nice base and understanding and trust of each other. So in the moment, they're less inclined to take things in the wrong way. Wow. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I love that. How do you create a space to do that? Because I feel like that's, for some people, would be a very like vulnerable thing to need to talk about those things. And I know a lot of teams wouldn't discuss situations like that. They would just let things happen. How do you, as the person coming in to help them create that space? Well, look, I think it's really important, as you said, to try to nip this stuff in the bud. So, yeah. you know, you can only run these kind of sessions where there is a good, healthy level of trust and a solid foundation. So you would take a different type of approach if things were already broken type thing. Um, but look, I think it's just all about how the leader, how you work together with the leader to position why we want to kind of have these more vulnerable style of conversations and what the benefit of these vulnerable type of conversations is. So it's not just like a fluffy, nice to have. The reason we need to understand each other better and our motivators and our drivers of engagement and how we like to work is because uh, from a leadership perspective, this actually creates a better employee experience for each member of the team. And so if each member of the team is feeling heard, appreciated and happy, Mm that will kind of flow onto being able to create a great customer experience for, you know, whoever it is this um, group of people is serving. And so if the leader is doing a good job of kind of keeping the team all on task and people are feeling really happy, they're more inclined to kind of give their customers a really good experience each and every time. And that will flow down onto business results, better profitability, And just, you know, those results coming easier, smoother and consistently, no matter what's going on in the environment. So I think, you know, when you can kind of put it into context for people and why we want to kind of get to know you on a little bit more of the personal level, um, I think a lot of people do respond to that. And what I actually find is it's really powerful for people, not just in a work and a team sense. It actually gives people a lot of information about just how they are more broadly with their partner, the family, their kids. And yeah, you know, so I think a lot of people get a lot of bang for buck and probably more bang for buck out of these kind of work training situations than what they might initially think. Yeah, I agree. It is, it's interesting how work and life can be quite overlapping. Mm-hmm. And through, I've had the same experience. Like there's been work situations where I've learned a lot about myself personally and work mm-hmm. opportunities as well, where it's, yeah, really helps you understand who you are and how you do things. Because I think mm-hmm. sometimes the way that you can interact with team members can be similar to the way you in- interact at home or with your 100%. friends. So that's a really good point as well, being able to improve like from a whole life sort of perspective. Definitely. Um, something else I was thinking, I would love to understand how you, when you meet with a team or a leader, how you yep. define success. So you were talking about all the amazing things that can come from it. So how trust can lead to like better business results, but mm-hmm. how do you, how do you get that leader or that team on board and sort of come up with that? This is where I we think, be. <laughs> So I think when you're trying to define success, values are really important. So understanding what are the business values? Yeah. Uh, what are the team's values? And yeah, understanding what success look like for this particular team in this organization, because say, for example, if you're working in a government organization, uh, your measure for success is going to be quite different to Mm -hmm. private enterprise, right? Like obviously money and bottom line is always critical, uh, but you know, a lot of organizations are very strong on values now, as well as um, corporate social responsibility. And I think we saw this, um, the great response from businesses um, earlier this year with the bushfires and how just, Mm. you know, all organisations got found, everyone was trying to find a really authentic way that was meaningful for them and their customers and their product and their business to kind of support the bushfire situation. So what I'm actually seeing now, and actually the data really backs this up, when you're looking at, um, even when shareholders look at evaluating a company in terms of wanting to, you know, invest in that company, actually financial performance rates 
about three out of five and actually things like corporate social responsibility, the employee experience and engagement, it's actually amazing to see that those factors sometimes even rate above um, bottom line financial impact. So shareholders and, and just the general community are really understanding now that if leaders are doing things in the right way and looking for that successful outcome um, through doing that, through looking after their people, having the customer's best interests in mind and just generally being a good corporate citizen, that we know that the financial results will follow because, um, you know, people buy leaders now and what they stand for. And mm. I think, you know, with the internet and everything now, everyone has a voice, Google reviews. So if you're not, it's not just enough to kind of be transactional anymore. People really want to get to know you and what you stand for. So I think... Yeah, I love uh, that. Yeah, coming back to what you said about success, a successful leader in a team is one that actually knows what they stand for. And whenever they hit a roadblock or something that comes outside of the day-to-day -day process, they're kind of using those values as a marker for uh, success or uh, really kind of as decision-making criteria for what way should we go here? What's going to be best for our customers in line with what we believe in, etc. So yeah, I think the definition of success in business has really, really grown and expanded. Not enough just to make money anymore. You've got to do it in yeah, the right way. Definitely. I feel like a lot of people will go with a lot of businesses or choose to like engage with them because of what they stand for over price. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's definitely happening and I feel like it's happening more over time. So, so, with, so when you meet with them, you sort of find out what their values are. So you ask, Absolutely. what are your values? And then using those values, you connect that to where they want to be and what they would need to do to get there. Is that right? Yep, that is exactly right. Exactly right. Yep. yep. So it's all about change management, not project management, if that makes sense. You've got to take into account um, all the feelings and all the sentiment, all the kind of the non-quantitative data, along yep. with all the qualitative stuff. So yes, it is really important to get a hold of strategic reports, engagement reports, um, cultural reviews and all of that um, personality profile data, whatever kind of data uh, the team has in respect to what they're wanting to change. But it's also really important to understand the lay of the land through asking some of these questions like, um, you know, is the team functioning well together? What are your relationships like? How do you find you get the best out of your team? So always ask some of those kind of diagnostic questions to understand those intangibles too, so that I know that when I'm trying to drive a process with a team, that I'm doing it in the right way, the way that's going to resonate for them. Yeah, love it. Yeah. So when you're working with clients, let's say something comes up. So there might be something that they do that they want to improve. So it could be yeah. they might not have trust for their team or they're not creating trust in their team. What sort of like specific strategies do you use to help them improve? The number one specific strategy is it's got to be a participative approach, right? You've got to truly get people's buy-in to the issue, right? So... Mm -hmm. Number one, you've got to be able to bring this issue to the fore and actually understand and start a conversation. Like, is this even in people's minds? Do they know it's an issue? Yep. And do they want to change, right? Because if you don't want to change, you can throw everything at someone and you're just going to be hit with resistance. So if they don't want to and they're not ready to change. So assessing change readiness is a really important thing to do in any kind of behaviour change initiative. So I think that's why it's always, that's what you've got to really clarify at the start because if people aren't ready to change, you're going to have to just wind it back and come back with a bit of a different approach so that in the long term you get the result that you're after. Yeah. So how do you do a change? How do you do change readiness? Like this is yeah. totally new to me. So I'd love if I had to go and meet with a leader or meet with someone who needed to get to that space where they could change, how would I actually do that? Um, I think there's so many different ways to skin a cat. There's so many um, change management frameworks out there, surveys. So you can do it in a really formalized way or you can do it in a really informal way, which I think, you know, is probably the, the best way to go, especially if you, yeah, you know, you're trying to design a, a workshop, or you're trying to design a online solution. Um, yeah. It's just really important to kind of, yeah, understand that change is all about people's 
mindset. Uh, so yeah, you've got to ask a lot of and understand, you know, the change curve and how people yeah. have different emotions yep. and you can move around on the change curve. So it's really important to kind of be able to assess on that change curve. Um, where are the different members of your team? And are people kind of cycling through it this way or are they kind of dipping back? And yep. what other factors outside of our, con- like what's within our control and what's outside of our I control? Yeah. So any change management process, like you can only really focus on what is in your control or what is within your influence. So yep. being able to kind of set that scene and set expectations at the front end is really important yep. too because there's no point getting everyone G'd up and motivated um, if really the change isn't within their control. So I think assessing yep. those kind of things, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm wondering as well, how do you have some sort of way of knowing when someone's not completely in it? Like reading someone when you're with them and you're talking them through something, how can you tell that they're not quite there? Because that's something we do. Ours is a lot of online learning, but if we do virtual yeah. workshops or yeah. we're speaking to someone, it'd be good to know like if yeah. someone's not quite there and how to pick that up. Look, I think the number one thing is if words and actions don't match. Oh, okay. So people yeah. might be telling you, yep, yep, I'm on board, but then something in their body language or their tone of their voice or uh, maybe they just don't send you that follow-up email that you ask for or, you know, and and you on the other hand are getting really frustrated. Like they said they're on board. They said they were going to do this. Why aren't they doing it? Yeah. And it can be so tempting in that situation to start getting pissed off and frustrated, right? And that is your trigger and your signal to actually turn that around into kind of empathy and perspective taking and go, all right, why, why is this happening? Why are they dragging their feet? Is there something else genuinely that's going on for them? Or maybe that's an opportunity to pick up the phone and ask them and say, look, I know we'd agreed to this deliverable, so-and-so, you know, how are you going with it? Are you busy? Have you got other things on your plate? Is there an easier way for us to achieve this outcome? So I think listen to that signal. We all know instinctively deep down, I think if someone's not truly ready or they haven't really agreed with us. So I'd always say, listen to your instinct and then check that understanding. So if you do have that feeling or you're getting some kind of signal from the outside that something's not right, just attend to that and be comfortable to step outside of your process to have that conversation because that builds trust and it builds respect. So if you can, and it helps you get to the heart of what the issue is as well and understand why that person might be experiencing a block. So if you give that person a safe space to have that conversation with you and actually show them that you care about how they're feeling and, you know, why they why that block's there, 99% of the time people will open up and yes. tell you the truth. They feel safe with you. And then that can actually be um, a really kind of strong step in terms of just getting whatever outcomes that you need, right? Once you work through that emotional barrier with someone, then you'll see how everything can just flow better. So I think where people go wrong sometimes is they stress too much about, like, What process or what framework are we going to use? Yes, we need to know what we're doing, but it's really important not to forget about that person in front of you and establishing a good working relationship with them, not only in the good times, but also, you know, when you can see that something's not quite right with them. Just don't ignore it. Just ask the question and see see if they're willing to go there with you. Yeah, I love that. So just like come out with it, don't hold back. Is there a way, because you obviously don't want to get on the bad side of the client, of so you just not. Sort of say, could you just say something like, I'm noticing this or um, yeah, I think, a bit more about yeah. that? Like, what's some of the language that you would use to get that from the client? Yeah, I think um, just exactly what you just said, just popping out your observations there. Look, I've noticed, um, I've just noticed, um, you know, we'd agreed that in this week that you'd have this back to me. Um, I just want to see how you're going. Um, is something else, you know, I think, yeah, just soft, the softly, softly approach is the right approach. Like definitely not accusing, <laughs> um, definitely not being too, <laughs> just, like, 
Yeah, well, you know, like the demanding, you know how when we get yeah. frustrated, we can go more into the detail and more into our action orientation and that real directive style, that this is not the time to be directed. This is the time to, to lead with empathy and understanding and care. So I think if you, if you keep that empathy and care thing in mind in terms of how you approach a conversation and the other person understands your intent and where you're coming from, if your intent's good, generally you'll get a good response from that person. Yeah, love it. That's great. Something else I love psychology. I'm so interested mm-hmm. in psychological strategies. And yeah, I feel like that, that's why I love your LinkedIn posts as well when you talk mm-hmm. about those sort of things. I'm like, oh, it's so good. Uh, and we try to use it for our solutions. So we try and think about yeah. the human brain and how people think about certain things. Yeah. Um, tell me about some of the strategies you use, like psychological strategies that you use in your work. Absolutely. So number one, don't overload people with too much information, right? Because we can only hold seven to nine pieces of information in our working memory at any one time, right? So um, yeah, even on a slide, definitely don't ever put more than kind of five to nine points on a slide or you're going to lose people, right? And less is definitely more in any kind of training. Uh, And I think another hack that I always use in training is I try to um, put up a a diagram or framework or some kind of concept for people. And I try to teach that concept because once you share the concept or the broader idea with people, then it's about how you bring them along the journey to understand where their experience feeds into this kind of framework, whatever it is that you're talking about. So, So tell me about your past experience and how that maps onto this framework let me teach you about the framework from a theoretical psychology perspective and then let's apply it where to from here in terms of getting some real actionable change and cut through and difference in your habits and the way that you're working let's brainstorm and create some space to actually think about how we're going to do things differently and put some measures and checkpoints in place to make sure that that can happen right so that's adult that's adult learning and that's experiential learning so Um, always assuming that the group or the customer in front of you, they come with a wealth of knowledge and it's your role as the facilitator or the trainer to be able to draw out that wealth of knowledge and make it connect and make it meaningful for people Um, and then actually help them to apply that because it's all well and good to kind of raise awareness and teach. But, you know, if you don't get change, it's all about getting change in behaviour and, you know, getting betterment. So... That's what really drives me. So I think less is more and trying to just put one or two key ideas in front of someone to digest because there's so much information flying at us all the time, so many conflicting priorities. So if you try to kind of bite off more than you can chew, you're going to lose people through that sense of overwhelm. So, you know, one idea per module and actually creating some space in between modules is really important as you would know because it gives people that opportunity to digest and try out the new idea or concept and come back to you with their learnings which you can again start that process of again kind of unpacking and debriefing what works well um, what would you do differently next time what did you learn from that experience so yeah it is really a journey a step-by-step journey so being realistic about what you can expect um, from each and every conversation one conversation at a time yeah i love that i totally agree when there's too much content at at once it can be so overwhelming and i've even been in workshops before where it's just like so much content and you sort of go out for lunch and you're just like oh my gosh that was just too much so i love that how you say you just focus on one model or something that they can sort of compare themselves to and work with them that way. I really love that. What's some of the models that you use? Oh, <laughs> what are some of the models that I use? Um, I used one on Tuesday about quick wins, mm-hmm. right? So uh, how do you, you know, while it's really important for businesses and teams to have an overarching strategy, or product or whatever it is that they sell or service that they offer. Um, COVID environment 19 times to keep people really engaged and really motivated. It's also important that along with that kind of day-to-day um, kind of focus that we've got in mind in respect to how we're going to rebuild the business, uh, we also need to be able to strive for some quick wins to keep people motivated and engaged and keep some money coming through the door. So um, 
on Tuesday I shared the quick wins paradox. Uh, so a really good article about um, how, to, how leaders need to get quick wins in the right way, so with and okay. through the team in a collective manner, yep. as opposed to individually searching for runs on the board and success, right? So yep. all about really good transitions as a leader and the five traps that a leader can fall into when they're trying to drive for results. So micromanaging, um, okay. yeah, intimidating others. So um, basically what I try to do when you ask me what models do I use is I get the brief from the client and then I think about in terms of my psychology background and history, what, who is the expert in these areas? And yeah, I always find a model that they've, that they've kind of put out there at some point to help people understand that context so yeah. it's always around change essentially it's always yeah. about how do you go from a to b so how do you go about achieving this outcome that the clients told me that they want and what do i know in terms of best practice psychology around human mindset and behavior uh you know what behavior stuff and psychology stuff do we need to understand in order to make sure that we break through this barrier and smash this goal and outcome so does that kind of answer your, I'm, yeah, I'm very agnostic exactly. when it I comes love, to like, frameworks. I love frameworks and theories as well. Like studying psychology, it was so cool, like learning about all the different ones. And I think you're so right, being able to compare yourself to those, it helps you sort of understand, like when you're talking about the leaders where there's different things they could be doing, it sounds like it would really help them reflect on the way that they act as a leader and help them even discover why they need to change. Like it could even help with that motivation piece of, I could be or I could be doing things differently. Absolutely. And just yeah. normalizing it for people is really interesting with that the quick wins paradox that I was just talking about. The five traps that all transitioning leaders fall into, they are the same traps. Whether you are a first-time leader, a middle manager, or a senior leader, we all get caught up and trip up in exactly the same places wow. because it's just human nature. It's really hard to let go of your patch or what you've become an expert in and then kind of transition to the next step. So in order to be successful, it's not just about what are the new skills that you need to grow. It's also about what are some of the things that you need to be prepared to let go of so you can create that room for your ongoing success and you can actually empower other people coming up underneath you to grow and stretch themselves too because that can be so demotivating when we just don't mm. we hold up to things too much and it's often yeah. from a good place of wanting the perfection wanting the outcome but we've got to be prepared to have a little bit of rope in there and a little bit of you know room to move because we learn through making mistakes and trialing things out and that's how kids learn and that's why kids have such great imagination and innovation because we never kind of shoot them down for making a mistake. So why should we do that for adults? So it's all about that experimentation and imagination. Yeah, love it. So when you get people to realise that they need to change and you start them on that journey or that process to change, how do you, yep. how do you create habits? So something that we would really love to learn more about is how can we get, we can get our learners to be excited in the moment and feel like they want to change and, Maybe they'll do it for a week, but how do you get them to keep? And I'm sure yeah. you come across this in your work where someone's changed and then you might meet up with them again and they've sort of gone back a bit. How do you keep yeah. them? And yeah. Probably get so number, them. Yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah. Number one, don't bite off more than you can chew. Okay. So kind of three key focus habits or actions is the most. You should be looking to change at any one time. Um, probably one to two things is much more manageable for most people. Uh, regular check-ins are really important. Yep. So um, whether that's face-to-face, -face, whether that's using some kind of technology or app for tracking your progress, yep. um, you know, I think you, uh, there's a lot of opportunity in HR for more technology because we just see in health and fitness, for example, and other industries how useful technology is and uh, shared technology. So what I mean by that is, when we can drive out peer accountability um, through the tech. So uh, my brother was telling me the other day he started cycling quite a bit now with COVID-19 and there's an app that he uses that all his friends are on and they can see what time each other go for their bike rides, how mm -hmm. far they go, how fast they do it in. So that peer accountability is just such a big one, like in terms of getting a behaviour change because 
we kind of have to be confident to proclaim. So, so when you're trying to get change, you've got to kind of get that person to proclaim and be really comfortable stating, this is something I'm committing to and this is the change in outcome in yep. terms of my habit and these are the time frames. So time frames are important. This is how I'm going to do it. So yep. make sure you step down into the how because it's all well and good, as you said, to feel really motivated. But if you don't know what the step-by-step -step process is or you don't mm -hmm. spend time unpacking that to any extent with people, when push comes to shove and all the other daily pressures come in, they'll just revert back to what's easy and what's habit. So yep. spending some time actually unpacking the how, um, getting some points of accountability and, yeah, having some someone, a person that they're just committed to that is going to hold them to account in terms of driving that change. So whether that's you as a coach or the trainer, a colleague, family member, friend, whoever it is, and sometimes more than one point of accountability can be even more effective. So, yes, I think there's some of the good kind of uh, tips and tricks to hold people accountable. Amazing. I love that. Thank you for that. My pleasure. The other thing was, so you do a lot of facilitation by the looks of it. So I've looked on your LinkedIn and knowing a little bit about what you do, what tips do you have for facilitation? So we spend a lot of our time obviously designing electronic things, but we also will be running workshops and there'll be instructional designers out in the world who will be running workshops. What are your tips for facilitation? Um, my tips about facilitation is really remember that you are there to serve the group. Uh, and at the end of the day, you are there for them. It's all about them, right? So that can sometimes remove a lot of that stress and anxiety that facilitators can feel about actually having to step up and be the centre of the attention in front of the group because that can be really intimidating, kind of being at the front and just being looked at by all of these mm -hmm. eyes on you for like two hours. <laughs> It can feel really overwhelming. You're like, crap, how am I going to remember everything that I need to say? Um, how am I going to deal with resistance? What about if no one speaks up? So I think it's really important um, to remember that, you know, what is it that they want to get out of this and how can I help serve them? Yeah. It's also really important to set the scene early in the facilitation. So why are we here today? What do we want to learn in terms of the agenda? Why is it important to you? And then really ask some kind of question. You have to get their involvement early on in the facilitation. So yeah. in the first kind of 15 to 30 minutes, you need to ideally be able to get each member of the group to say, hi, I'm so-and-so. This is what I want to get out of the session today. Yes. And get that dialogue started early. I think that's a biggest piece of advice I can give where I see it fails is if the facilitator spends too much time talking at the front end as opposed to getting the, the, the hook in and the buy-in and understanding what each person in that room really wants to learn and get out of it, right? Because not yeah. only do you understand better where to drive the conversation, um, they feel like they're becoming a part of it and it's a participative type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think... Those are really important. And then the third one is stay in the moment. So be confident that you know your stuff. Do your preparation beforehand. And then on the day that you get up to facilitate, just go, you know, make attend to your own mindset and make sure you're calm and open and you're in the moment. Deal with any kind of objections that come with you and so that the people in front of you feel like they're being heard by you. Yes. So a lot of it is your own self-management that you've got to be able to bring However you're feeling that day, that really sets the tone for how the facilitation is going to go. Yeah. Love that. That's awesome. Thank you. That's um, okay. Another question I had was, so we spoke about unconscious brain activity. Yeah. That can come from, so you could be doing the surveys and that could come up through those surveys. How do you do something about that <laughs> if it's unconscious yeah. how do you get people to notice those things and change their behavior that's a really good question so usually people will describe symptoms of a of a problem mm -hmm. as opposed to being under, understanding what the problem itself is right or that unconscious issue is yeah so it's really important to initially start the conversation with people around um, the symptom and then gradually you'll be able to peel it back so why do you think you're feeling like this 
When do you notice it? Where does it play out for you? Why do you think this is happening? So once you have understood this, it's like a doctor, you know, who asks all about the symptoms, then you can kind of start putting out there what you think the diagnosis is. Interesting. And potentially start talking about some of these unconscious processes that go on in the brain. And then it's all about, yeah, making it meaningful for the person in front of you. So bring that unconscious stuff to the fore because, yeah, as you're saying, we don't know what we don't know. So if we don't know that it's happening, how can we address it? So it's all about kind of trying to meet someone where they're at and go on that journey of awareness with them. Yeah, love that. That's awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to share around psychology and how it can be used for learning? I think learning is all about psychology. So I don't know what you think from your end, but I think having a basic understanding of people and behavior and change and motivation can yeah. only benefit any kind of learning and training, whether that be um, how to put together e-learning or face-to-face -face learning. Yeah. I think um, really understanding the mindset of the learner, where they are, where they are now and where you want them to be at the end of your learning module. Yeah. Um, and thinking about that from a, like a mindset perspective on balance with the content that you need them to learn, that's yeah. going to help you get the optimal outcome and the, and the cut through and ultimately the change in mindset and the change, the long lasting change in the habit. So um, where are they now? Where do I want them to get to at the end of the training? And what kind of checkpoints or help am I going to give people to be able to make that leap? Um, kind of once my intervention is over and then, you know, back in their day to day, yeah. how can I make sure that they're going to get the value? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Are there any like books or websites you look at or any resources that you use to keep yourself up to date and learn more about those sort of psychological things that you can use? Oh, that is a really good question. I'm just, I just love following different I think it's got to be right whoever resonates with you so yeah. when you're on LinkedIn when you're on Facebook when you're on Instagram like so many different people resonate for me so uh so for example because I'm going on my own business journey I love um, reading about female entrepreneurs so they might have nothing to do with psychology so um, the skincare products that I use are designed by this amazing woman in Melbourne, this amazing female entrepreneur that is um, in the 70s. She was at high school. She wanted to be a chemist. And everyone said back then that women can only be teachers or nurses. And her dad said to her, no, chase after your passion and your dream, whatever that is, and you'll find success in the end. So, you know, for me, I identify with that as a female entrepreneur. So I'm always on the lookout for female entrepreneurs because um, I'm trying to build an online brand. I'm always looking for examples of people who have built a successful online brand and I follow them because I do psychology. There are a couple of people that I think are quite awesome from a psychology perspective. So, uh, you know, like I love Simon Sinek. Um, I love... <laughs> Simon Sinek's awesome. I love, um, I love this, this guy called, I don't know if you've read this book. This is one of my favorite books. So why do so many incompetent men become leaders wow. and how to fix it? And that is such a controversial title, this book, right? And it's written by this Argentine psychologist who was the head of, uh, it's called Hogan Assessment. So the leadership okay. assessments that I was speaking about before the bright side, the dark side and the inside. Yep. And he, cause I love lead, I love leadership, right? So that's why I'm talking about Simon Sinek and this guy. I look for who are the contemporary leaders in the field of leadership and I, I follow their ideas love it. and yeah, that's how I try to stay contemporary. I, I try to share the latest with my customers, the latest thinking yep. and leave it up to them if it resonates with them and what they want to take from it. So kind of, I see my job as being able to know what's out there, be able to kind of bring that together in terms of filter through that information, what I think is important, put that in front of someone and then you know, help them make their own mind up about it and what resonates for them. So I would say to you, whatever it is that you're passionate about, um, follow those people and that will lead you in the right direction to where you need to go. I love so. that. That's awesome. Very inspiring. <laughs> um, so something else for 
on that for facilitation oh sorry for leaders like if you if you had one message for leaders out there in the world for them to be the best possible leader that they could be because I know you're so passionate about leadership what would your advice be for them be yourself um always be yourself and just keep trying to be the best version of you right so be yourself, lead authentically, lead through your own strengths and your own values is so yep. important. Um, always be self-aware. So make sure you put aside regular time to think through what am I doing well? What didn't feel quite right? Where can I be better? Um, so it's always be prepared to stay in that learner mindset. The best leaders stay in that learner mindset and they've got motivation to change and keep being better. So be yourself, be authentic. Um, always keep in mind that we are lifelong learners and I think growth mindset would have to be the third one that, you know, I've never quite reached my destination. Um, there's always more, there's always possibility, abundance, things can always be better or different. So, yeah. Love it. Very good. For a growth mindset, how do you get people to have that? Because I know some people might naturally have it or it might be something they want to work towards. How do you get, like, what would people have to do to have a growth mindset? I think to have a growth mindset, you've got to be open to change. So I think that is the number one thing I would work through. Why do you think change isn't possible? Why do you think it is as it is, right? So why do we have this status quo? And where is there the opportunity to be able to make some tweaks to that status quo thinking? Yeah, so I think you've got to break through the, the change in the habits and the mindset barrier to get to be able to push someone into that growth mindset. Yeah, love it. So for leaders who wanted to help their team have more of a growth mindset, how would they do that with their team? Um, the number one best thing you can do is role model that through your actions and through your behaviour and through the way that you respond to different people and situations. Yeah. yeah, so obviously teaching them about growth mindset, but also embodying it and kind of that really strongly reinforces it. Yeah. And I suppose they're helping people uh, explore for them where that change is possible and where you can um, get some of that more growth belief and mindset. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, love it. So it awesome. sounds like just wrapping up what we've spoken about, it's been so interesting. Yep. So thank you so much. I feel like I've got so much insight into psychological strategies and the way that our mindset can hold us back what leaders can do to help their team have a growth mindset how they can be the best leader um i feel like i've learned so much about how when you can when you're meeting with people the way that you can be really honest and open with them and that way you can build that good relationship so thank you so much it's been so amazing to speak with you is there anything else you'd like to leave us before we finish up No, it's just my absolute pleasure. And I really enjoyed the fact that this was so off the cuff. I think it was a really nice format, really nice conversation. Um, And I'm really excited to just, um, you know, see um, where you girls go in the future with Belle Vista because I really love that your brand personality speaks through, um, you know, the work that you're doing and that you're also trying to build thought leadership in this space of learning design. So I think that's really special and it's really unique. I'm looking forward to keeping connected with you guys in the future. Thank you. Everyone, please share this episode with who you think it'll add value to. Please follow Eleni on LinkedIn. She has amazing LinkedIn posts. They're so beautifully presented. Like every time I see them, I'm like, oh, they're just amazing. Um, And you're very generous with sharing your knowledge on LinkedIn. So I think everyone should be following you on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for being on the show. You continue to inspire our team. And I know that the other team members of Elvis Studios can't wait to watch this episode. We've all been following you on LinkedIn. So thank Thank you so much. It's been awesome. And I'm looking forward to catching up when COVID-19 is over with you guys. Awesome. Thank you you so much, Anna.